Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Fort Hare Philosophy Colloquium. We are honored to host Professor Chima Konam today, who will be speaking about Super Alton studies, the philosophical psychology of a reluctant victim. So, but before that, I would like to give a short introduction to Professor Chima Konam. Uh, he currently teaches in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Pretoria. He's also a research, he's also a senior researcher, fellow, uh, research fellow at the Center of Interdisciplinary and Intercultural Philosophy at the University of Tübingen in Germany. Um, Professor Chimekonam's teaching and research interests cover the areas of African philosophy, logic, intercultural philosophy, environmental ethics, philosophy of religion, and postmodern decolonial thought. He is a major proponent of the conversational approach to philosophy. He articulated and defined the system of conversational thinking, its method, philosophy, and a system of logic called Ezumezu that grounds it. He has published many articles, chapters, and books. Amongst others, he is a co-author of the new book, African Metaphysics, Epistemology, and a New Logic, a Decolonial Approach to Philosophy, published by Palgrave last year, 2021. So now I'd like to give the floor to you, Professor Chimekonam. It is a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much, um, uh, Philippe. I am glad to uh, be here to give this talk. I thought it was going to be postponed since I came down with a very nasty flu. Uh, I'm still struggling to shake off anyways. Thank you very much for having me, University of Fort Hare, and thanks to everyone who's been able to join us from different parts of the world. Uh, the subject of uh, my discussion today is a, a new idea that some of us are trying to uh, put together. Um, like you saw in my abstract, I, I give credit to the uh, uh, this idea, the initial nurturing of this idea to uh, Bjorn Freta, uh, whose works over the years have variously suggested uh, ideas that border on super alternative, super alternative studies. As a matter of fact, early this year, um, he decided to, that one way, uh, he decided to uh, edit a collection on the subject and invited me to contribute his chapter. Um, and in the last few months, both of us have had to uh, have some exchange, email exchanges and meetings discussing our ideas as it concerns this uh, area of study known as super time studies. What I will be discussing today would uh, mainly be about my own thinking concerning that area of study. And in some ways, I will endeavor to uh, show the similarities, areas of convergence and divergence between my own ideas and John Freitas' um, ideas. So um, thank you very much for joining us once more. Uh, to start, it's important that I note that the trend in world intellectual history for the last three centuries or so uh, is one in which it is the prerogative of the West to study the minds of the so-called barbarians in a lopsided binary fashion. Of course, in early modern period in European history, kings and queens, governments, philanthropists and universities in the West to this day have funded and continue to fund Western scholars to study other peoples and write their histories, the case may be. So nowhere was this very practice made more manifest in the modern time than at the University of Göttingen, Germany founded in 1734. Um, I believe that super old time studies will give us the allowance to philosophically the psychology, this psychology uh, can tell us a lot about the problem 
of divided lines that manifest in different ways in society. Uh, here, we will be looking, we'll be able to come closer uh, to the mind of a racist, for example, analyze the fractures in it, and be able to determine the connection between it and the troubles of our world in both moral and cognitive terms. Um, uh, and so that is the uh, goal of um, superior time studies. As I mount on to the slide that I was able to put together, um, I hope you can still see the slide. Can you? Uh, yes, we can. Or oh, I okay. can. Hopefully others okay. as well. Okay, so let me move it and hope that you can see uh, the slide move. All right, so um, let me begin by giving us background to this subject of super time studies. All right, right about the 1980s, this, some Indian scholars led by um, Ranaji Guha, they began to think on the idea of recovering the history of the formerly colonized peoples, which they believe um, uh, uh, has been distorted, you know, and uh, taken um, over by colonial narratives in the structure of Western history. So their aim was to reclaim that history. Uh, they published a series of essays based on the concept of the subaltern that the Italian philosopher Antonio Gramsci used uh, in, in his prison um, notebooks to describe the subordination of formerly colonized peoples. These scholars in India and Southeast Asia, as the case may be, began to articulate an idea around this concept of the subaltern. Some decades down the line, uh, the area of subaltern studies is now a very big a subject of study in po by post-colonial theorists, by war system analysts, and a host of other decolonial thinkers, as the case may be. However, there's a gap in that literature, in the literature of subaltern studies. Whereas it tries to study people, cultures, their histories in ways that they've been um, um, controlled by Western uh, scholars and scholarship uh, denied through colonial history that subjugates and subordinates them. Uh, that's this, this gap, very little attention has been paid in these uh, subaltern studies to the mentality of the subaltern itself. So much attention paid to the history, so much attention paid to the developmental issues, so much attention paid to problems and all kinds of economic and political issues uh, that, um, uh, that keep and um, place the formerly colonized people at great disadvantage. So much attention paid to all that by post-colonial scholars like Artris Spivak and a host of others who have um, uh, contributed immense ideas in subaltern studies. Uh, little attention is paid to the mind of the subaltern and no attention actually, uh, little to none to the best of my knowledge has been paid to the study of the superaltern and the mind of the superaltern. And that is why um, our approach in superaltern studies would be a decolonial uh, one that seeks to investigate the philosophical psychology of the superaltern and the consequences of a new logism called superalternism, um, the victims and the society at large. I will elaborate on this as we go on. So um, uh, these post-colonial thinkers, like, like I said, pay little attention to the mentality of the subaltern and of course the superaltern because the damage done by colonialism uh, they believe are mainly historical, that is economic. The post-colonial developmental initiative. So the question now is, 
how much effort is being made by the uh, former colonial uh, powers, as well as those who were formerly colonized to get things right, to correct them, to right the wrongs, to put the formerly colonized people and economies on proper pedestal and on a proper path. That seems to be the uh, much of the point and to highlight the evils and the challenges and problems that colonialism as an ideology has brought upon the peoples that were formerly colonized and the lingering effects that it is having in different ways. So, but I will use the concept of subalternism uh, and uh, superalternism to describe a more insidious damage uh, following colonialism. And what are those damages in question? I refer to inferior and superior mentalities. I will elaborate as we move forward. So I'll conceive superaltern studies as a decolonial disciplinary investigation into the nature of causes and implications of superior mentality on society. I will coin superalternism as the neologism for superior mentality. Already, uh, you may by now have the impression that um, my idea of superalternism is not uh, the one that paints a picture of a dominator, entitled dominator, the powerful dominator that uh, can do whatever. Uh, it wishes, gets away with it. That also, but most importantly, I paint a picture of a dominator that is also a victim, in much the same way as the subaltern is a victim of the ideology of colonialism. And I will again um, highlight that colonialism is probably one of the most dangerous of all ideologies in history, chiefly because of his ability to mutate and replicate. Um, colonialism, for example, has been able to mutate into uh, neocolonialism, cultural imperialism, uh, and coloniality. You know? And um, of course, many decolonial scholars like Aniwa Quinhano. Uh, Maldonado Torres Nelson, um, Gross Fogwell, Walter Mignolo, and so on and so forth. I've uh, been able to track the development of of being, coloniality of power, coloniality of knowledge. No one, to the best of my knowledge, has been able to track the mutation of colonialism into what I now call in this presentation. Uh, reverse coloniality. Um, and, and I will try to elaborate on that concept as we move on. So, but hey, the initial concepts in these uh, super time studies have come uh, 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 in the work of um, Bjorn Freta, like I said. Of course, he never used the concept of super time studies, but uh, since the idea and the concept came up this year, and both of us have been thinking and uh, exchanging about it, I have discovered that quite a number of concepts and ideas that is floated so far align very well with the uh, burgeoning new discipline that we are working to develop. And I will show you, um, even though we share a lot in common and division, in this discipline that is still in its infancy, there's still some areas of divergence. And you'll see that in our preferred uh, conceptual developments and coinages. As you see before you there, uh, in his work, Prefreta would prefer to use the word superiorism, all right, uh, to describe that um, orientation uh, by some of those that belong to the uh, former uh, uh, people that were the former colonialists having this entitlement of being superior to other human beings and their culture being superior to other cultures, their epistemic formation being superior to what others have, having the idea that what they have is the standard 
And what the rest of the humankind uh, has is the imitation or some watered down something that is non-standard. So you see that binary there, standard, non-standard, classical, non-classical, as the case may be. Now, my preferred concept would be super alternism, and you will uh, understand why I prefer this concept as we move on. Because I believe, first and foremost, that the idea uh, that someone gets into their heads, that they are superior to other human beings uh, by mere geographical location of the color of their skin. It's nothing but um, delusion orchestrated by uh, some measure of um, 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 psychological problems uh, so far. I will elaborate on this at the uh, second to the last page of this talk. So again, Freta prefers the concept of subhumanism. I prefer this concept of subalternism. Why? Because I don't believe that any human being is subhuman, um, whether uh, actual or imagined. Freta is actually saying that um, formerly, uh, former colonialists think of themselves as superhumans, right? Uh, who are powerful and think of others as subhumans, okay? These are quite descriptive and they did not seem to, Freta uh, did not seem to tell us whether uh, these are actually imagined illusions or uh something that people have come to believe by certain things that they have put in place uh, in order to avoid any confusion whatsoever i prefer the concept of subalternism and then the concept of super of term so the concept of superhuman and white all right and um uh and the concept of um ontological fiction i use to describe the idea that someone gets into their head that they are superior by some form of scientific racism or argument based on biological determinism and so on and, and, so, on and so forth. Uh, Freta prefers the concept of existential fiction to characterize this, of course, but he thinks of those on the side of power the, uh, as the dominator Okay, who victimizes those on the other side that that things conceptualizes as the victims? I conceive both the super altern and the sub altern as victims, and um, then this is fundamental. Uh, Freta thinks that the um, the mental functioning of the sub altern is one that begins, okay, uh, that. Uh, gets the subaltern to eventually think of itself as superior and all appurtenances of his culture are superior. Further things that is one that begins by observation of difference. I think that it is the type of thinking that begins that is deeply influenced by powerful ideologies, not observation of anything whatsoever. And in terms of recommendations that Freta and I have, are making Freta in some of his publications have recommended what he calls that the concept of adseridation, a form of return, returning, coming back to whom you were for those who were formerly colonized, those who've been victimized, those who have been residualized over time and written out of history and rendered and presented as subhumans. The, uh, Freta recommends at seridation, a sort of return, something akin to uh, what um, Milka Cabral discusses in his um, a Great Return, and so on and so forth. I borrowed the concept of noetic propadute from Innocent Assos of the Calabar School uh, that recommends the re education of the mind because I believe that uh, the evils that pertain to binary, these lopsided binary relations of this world, whether it is in the form of racism or sexism or credoism and all forms of divided lines are things that evolve that emanate from the human mind. And you have to get, have to heal that mind, re-educate that mind. 
uh, to be able to see things differently and be able to create better things rather than creating evil. Now, Freta also uh, recommends the two concepts of desuperiorization and uh, desuperhumanization. Um, sorry, for um, the super all right? But I do not uh, accept this concept because somehow they tend to give the impression that the super all is actually superior or has succeeded in elevating itself to the point of being superior or superhuman. So we now need another elixir to get the superhuman uh, to, be, to, to disuperhumanize or to disuperiorize. I don't believe anyone is superior. I don't believe the superhuman is um, superhuman. Of course, Freta says that they are not, but the concept gives that impression. Uh, it, it, to to disuperiorize, one has to be superior. To disuperhumanize uh, can only be applied to a superhuman. And as a result, uh, my recommendation uh, would be what I call conceptual critique. And by conceptual critique, I don't mean identifying a concept that one does not like and criticizing it, no. I mean, um, um, uh, uh, one being conscientized, all right, enough um, during the conceptualization of any concept to be conscientized to ensure that both ethical and logical um, aspects of that concept are taken into consideration, uh, the conceptualized framing of that concept. For example, in order, in order not to create a concept so framed, not to create the possibilities uh, for injustices whatsoever. And I'll give you an example. Um, when people write and when we talk and we use the concept white to uh, represent the European uh, uh, people and we use the concept black to represent the African people, um, uh, we automatically embed injustice uh, uh, racial injustice in that process, such that um, even if one does not call someone black, all right, but one goes ahead to identify as white or to use that concept. The moment you do that, you draw a line between those who are white and those who are non-white, all right? Uh, so, so the conscientization to be aware of these and how value laden some of these things are when we frame up. Embedding all forms of injustices uh, is what the, the, the concept, my idea of conceptual critique is about. And just to clarify, uh, in the early modern history, when it was uh, the Göttingen School of History at the University of Göttingen, that I mentioned earlier, uh, where um, um, some actors there were trying to desperately to establish the veracity of scientific racism. That is the idea that people, some human beings, there are empirical data that can be appealed to to establish that some human beings are superior uh, 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 to others, all right? And you see actors like Christoph Meinas and uh, Johann Blumenberg, who were uh, amply sponsored at the University of Göttingen to produce uh, such um, uh, data and, and all that. And, and it is important for us to also understand that uh, quite a number of elaborate research were conducted in several European countries and universities uh, and in, uh, by European scholars as at that time to establish such scientific data. And uh, one of which is craniology, that is the study of the size of the skull, the shape of the skull, and the size of the brain uh, inside the skull. We believe that uh, the bigger the brain, the more intelligent the species is. 
and, um, and, 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 and amongst human race, they began that study. And quite many European scholars were funded by their governments, by funders and philanthropists to go to different parts of the world, uh, harvest the scores of people um, and study them. The Germans, of course, uh, allowed their scholars you know, to cut away the bodies of the uh, some uh, native people in, in, in Namibia that they killed. And for such studies, and many of their scholars are still there in several um, uh, museums of different universities in Germany to this day. So now these studies were carried. And the funny thing is that they dis what they discovered was different from what most of these scholars published eventually. And it was what they published that um, People like the Jeffersons of the United States of America, even Abraham Lincoln, uh, during his interviews, um, uh, uh, when during his campaigns, was quite um, clear of the superiority of Europeans to Africans. And a host of other people, and people who are not in the empirical sciences like Immanuel Kant, uh, David Hume, Trevor Loop and the rest of them, it was what these scientists published that these people latched onto to propagate all forms of falsehood about uh, human intelligence and the uh, brain capacity of human, various human races, something that um, perpetrated and then continues to perpetuate uh, scientific racism to this very day. Now, um, in 1830, in 1836, a German scholar uh, known as um, um, uh, Tedman uh, addressed, addressed um, uh, the Royal School, uh, Royal Institute of um, uh, uh, Natural Sciences, it was in Great Britain, uh, if I recall. And um, in that address, what what he did was to collect tall different European libraries and collect the empirical data that these scientists generated actually in studying the brain capacity, brain sizes, and measuring the skulls of different human races to collect those data and compared all of them to indicate that these scientists that made all these studies published a false result where they indicated, most of them, that, for example, the brain size and the skull size of the European um, uh, is bigger than those of other races. That the brain size and the skull size of the African is smaller than those of the European, okay? Which were not what they got generated in their data. And Tidman was able to, present this before the um, uh, Royal Inst Institute of um, Natural, uh, something I, I don't remember precisely, I was able to present this data. Um, and, and in that data, it may shock you to know that the brain size and the skull size of some peoples in Africa are actually far bigger than those of the Europeans. I'll give you an example of that data. Um, um, the brain size and the skull size, the brain size of the Igbo, Igbo people are people, uh, from Nigeria, West Africa. According to the data that Tidman presented that the European scientists generated themselves, the brain size of the Igbo, Igbo person from West Africa, the highest weighing of the brain size of the evil person weighed 54 ounces. And there was only one group of people from Eastern Europe, Ukraine, uh, uh, around that place, that their highest yeah, weight brain uh, weighed higher than that of the evil man. And um, that and theirs weighed 57 ounces. And these were the highest weighing, biggest brains uh, sizes uh, that in all the data generated, they, they remain silent about this. In, all, in, in that case, the, the, the highest weighing brain size of the Germans 
that we are tested across different data generated with 45 ounces. Compare 45 ounces, the same thing with the British, the same thing with the French, 45 ounces, the highest. Others weigh far less. Compare that with the brain size of the Igbo man that weighed, that weighed 54 ounces. And then they went ahead and presented a data, doctored the data, presented, left the data, presented, published the results that indicated that the brain sizes of Africans were smaller than those of the Europeans. So, so now these these um, are some of the uh, distortions that I will come to uh, much later. But the the, the third uh, suggestion and recommendation that I am making is what is I call fictionalization that involves the unmasking of the fiction um, that makes one have the impression that he is inferior and makes the other have the impression that he or she is superior. we we'll get to all this, but let us proceed now on having clarified the conceptual convergence and divergence between me and, um, and uh, Bjorn Freta. So in conceptualizing subalternism, I say it's a neologism for inferior mentality. Uh, uh, the subaltern is a victim of the extreme ideology of coloniality. Like I said, uh, these frame of minds were influenced by ideologies. And for subalternism, it is coloniality. For superalternism, I say it is reverse coloniality. Now, the idea of subalternism can fairly be traced in my reckoning to the works of Franz Fanon. If you check uh, his uh, Wretched of the Earth, he used the concepts of colonized intellectual and damning to describe the victim of colonialism, okay? Uh, who sees everything about his history, culture, and peoples as inferior to those of the colonialists, okay? Colin King um, uses the concept of deraciness, all right? And uh, Tempels uses the concept of um, evolu, all right? One who is evolving from being what some, somebody of a particular culture and wants to abandon all that because he's been brainwashed to think that all about his cultural appurtenances are inferior and barbaric. So he, wished to my, he wishes to migrate. Not a European. Colin King co co describes it that says that such a person has been deracinated. It's no longer here and all there, as the case may be. So, um, superalternism, for me, therefore, is a neologism for superior mentality, as opposed to subalternism. And I, I say that these two ideas, subalternism and superalternism, are, are two extremes, influenced by two extreme ideologies of coloniality and reverse coloniality. Now, um, superalternism is the mentality of some members of a group, sex, gender, race, class, who were the you know, former colonialists and their descendants who have this inflated self, sense of the self. And um, the superaltern, therefore, is deluded by means of that ideology to imagine in error that it is superior to the formerly colonized peoples. I'll show you why it is a delusion as we move on. The superaltern is therefore a victim of the extreme ideology of reverse coloniality. And reverse coloniality produces an inflated sense of the self. We'll get to a point where all this will make more sense. So both superaltern and the superaltern are victims. Unlike, unlike the Unlike in Freta's categorization, where the superaltern is the powerful dominator and the subaltern is the powerless victim, I show that both are victims of extreme ideologies, coloniality and reverse coloniality. <coughs> Sorry. 
And coloniality is a negative ideology. Ideology could be both positive and negative. <coughs> sorry, sorry. It's a stubborn flu. <clears throat> but I appear to be stubborn flu meets a stubborn person. Okay, so coloniality is a negative ideology that subjugates the mind and the epistemic formation of his victims, makes them feel that there is nothing of value to their cultures, their themselves, and, and what have you. It's intellectual, uh, and that is why it is more uh, in, uh, dangerous than other forms of um, other negative ideologies that are not intellectual. Uh, for example, colonialism itself, from which, from where coloniality mutated from. Now, reverse coloniality, you have to pay attention to this. For me, it's a positive ideology. Why is it a positive ideology? Because at the end of it is a glorious uh, impression, expectation. The victim of reverse coloniality uh, believes that there's something great uh, awaiting them, you know, are they in their pursuit? There's, a, there's hope. There's, there's, there's a promise that reverse coloniality gives. Whereas in coloniality, there is no such promise. It's a perpetual, constant reminder of how you are uh, the, the dam of this world. Okay? So both ideologies powerfully, I say, influence the intellectual activities of their victims leading to the problems of divided lines as we have it. Unlike Freta, who thinks that the development of the, the, the divisive mindset that leads to all these problems uh, starts with the observation of difference by the super -altar. Now, I think the two powerful ideologies influence uh, the mental construction of the super -altar and the subaltern, as I will show you later. So uh, to complete the scope that I define for so subaltern studies, um, I identify three you know, aspects. Uh, but to do that, let us even think of, try to uh, think of the trajectory of subaltern studies. It's, a discipline in its infancy, and was careful to delineate it. And the idea is that I am by no means saying that what I present here uh, is the the, 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 the the ultimate, no. I am presenting my views, and people are welcome to present theirs as well. So there are two ways of thinking of the trajectory of the Supertan studies. The first would be to conceptualize it as a decolonial critique of the superiorist mindset as an existence potential problem, all right? Okay, and the second one would be to think of super time studies as a decolonial critique of the imagination that a superior subjectivity and epistemology exist at all, besides a vacuous fiction and is ontological, psychological, moral and cognitive consequences on society. And uh, my favorite trajectory would be the second. Uh, because um, um, uh, even though the superiorist mindset is, is, is a problem, an existential one for that matter, uh, it does not tell us the full story. It does not tell us the full story. It is important that we understand uh, the ideological a foundation of the superiorist thinking uh, in order for us to uh, be at a point where we can, where we'd be able to charitably, more charitably discuss the, our subject. And I understand this. Uh, when you look into history and see the terrible things that people have done, I talk about colonialism, for example. The Belgians that killed some 20 million Congolese um, for all kinds of reasons, including the fact that some of them were unable to meet with the rubber quota assigned to them. You assign someone a quota to deliver um, 
1,000 liters of rubber in a week. The person is a slave labor, laborer. You're not paying the person anything. And the person delivers 998. And you feel that the best way to teach the rest a lesson in order not to miss their quota would be to skin this person alive, you know, hang the person upside down until death. And you're able to do this and until you kill close to 20 million of the people. Uh, anyone will condemn this, you know. And, um, and now they look at the mama in Kenya and, and all that. It's the British presided over. And all kinds of terrible things that the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Germans, the different European powers that participated in colonialism have uh, perpetrated and evils that are still ongoing. Anyone in their right minds will condemn all this. And as for one, I also condemn those things. However, have we bothered to consider the mindset, the state of the mind of the perpetrator of these atrocities? Have we bothered to pause and consider that? I believe that it has to be factored in. We have to study the mind of such a person. When the police arrests uh, a psychopath, a serial killer, who has killed 50 people, the news are washed with comments about the evil of that individual. But psychologists and tell you that this individual is acting out of impulses that are far beyond their control. That is also what we have to consider when we think of the evils that some people, some races have you know, carried out on others in this world. The state of mind of the perpetrators is important. We must consider that, and that is part of what Superotan studies uh, uh, wants us to do. Um, um, uh, and, and throughout the passage of time, uh, some centuries before now, it's been the pre uh, European West to Euro Western world to study the minds of other people and legislate or come to different conclusions as they deem fit or as their data present to them. And now it's time to also study the mind of this Euro uh, Western uh, uh, super old town. And let us also know what instigates, what inspires, what influences. What has influenced and continues to is pattern is and his mindset in the other parts of the world. And so um, there are four really um, aspects, dimensions of super time studies when we consider uh, the consequences that super autonism has in our world and in the lives of his victims. There are four principal dimensions that can be considered. And these, you recall, as I said at the beginning, is my proposals of what product of my own thoughts. Now, the first one is the ontological dimension. <clears throat> the constitution of the superaltern is based on an argument from biological risk determinism and other sundry arguments associated with uh, the defense of scientific racism that some uh, 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 biological determinism, for example, that um, things such as our genes account for our behavior, uh, how we develop and who we become, our genes, nothing outside our genes, genes, all right? So the environment, the idea of nurture, all those ones are factor in. So if you've grown to become a good person morally because you've got the right set of genes, if, if certain people have grown to be more successful than others, it's because they have much more superior genes, genetic intelligence, and what have you. Um, and, and, but hey, this argument and these associated different forms of defenses have been defeated and thoroughly trashed in the literature. And uh, a scholar that I cited, very comprehensive, empirical, qualitative research conducted and presented bef before learned uh, minds of the time in the area, this Tidman of 1836, 
And uh, in much more recent history, in 1981, Stephen Gould published a book he titled The Mismeasure of Man, which was aimed at um, countering arguments from biological determinism and scientific criticism. Uh, he would go on to revise that book in 1996, following the publication of the co-authored work on um, the bell curve of 1993. Uh, then he revised his own to respond. Uh, the, the, bell, the, the book of 1993, if I remember the authors, I'll tell you, was actually promoting the idea that, somewhat promoting the idea that biological determinism is true. And God, in 1996, revises his own to once again uh, demonstrate that it was all uh, a lie. Now, that some humans are superior to others is a fiction invented to prove a moot point. And you know, fictions have, are very powerful. Fictions are very powerful in controlling the world and in creating the problems that we have today. Um, uh, when we encounter something we do not know before, what do we do? We give that in a name, all right? Now, but what happens when we give something we already know that has a name, a fictional name, okay? Let's say, for example, uh, someone comes to some school children who have never seen an ostrich before, and then and tells the school children that um, there, there is an animal called an um, uh, elephant bird, all right? The children have seen elephants and have seen birds. What do they do? They begin to piece together the ideas of an elephant and that of a bird. And then in their imagination, they have this being, this creature called elephant bird, all right? And that is deceptive. It's, it's not true. And, and, and the idea that some humans are superior to others is simply not true. A human being cannot become a superhuman. It's not possible. There's nothing like that. A human being cannot become a subhuman. It's not true. It's like saying that a circle is rounder than itself. It's not possible. It's like saying that an oak, you know, can be bigger than itself. That's not true. It's not possible, all right? But these fictions are created. And I will tell you, as I inch closer to the mentesis of this talk, how these things are created, how the, the mind of the super time was constructed. So the deflated project of scientific racism constructed by Christoph Maynas and Johann Blumenbach, um, um, John, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we have 10 more minutes left uh, till two o'clock. So if you can just look at the time so that you can um, start finishing off the talk. So oh, we okay. have, we can prolong it a little bit if everybody agrees, but I think just to remind you about the time, okay? Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. So let me proceed and leave that detail. Then there's this psychological dimension, all right, uh, to the superaltern studies, creation of the superaltern and superaltern as victims. And the superaltern becomes a victim of inflated sense of the self. Uh, just like the subaltern is a victim of the deflated sense of the self. Uh, the subaltern becomes a victim of racism, discrimination, marginalization, Injustice, subordination, all forms of subjugations, all right? One with an inflated sense of the self is a victim of reverse coloniality. One with a deflated sense, a victim of coloniality. The idea that a human All right, uh, and of course, you know that morality is always there to drive a wedge to the implementation of any crooked ideas, okay? When slavery was booming, uh, morality stood up as it crashed. Uh, Superotan mentality created colonialism, and then morality stood up again in the, in the guise of 
colonial uh, nationalists and opponents of colonialism. And when it crashed, racialism uh, took hold and then mutated to colonialism, coloniality. Now, the immorality of superalternism is thus set on the logical Babylon framework that empowers the superaltern and disempowers the subaltern. And, um, and this quote by Charles Darwin, in, uh, captured in his book, The Voyage of the Beagle, uh, is um, uh, apt. He says, if the misery of our poor be caused not by the laws of nature, but by our institutions, then great is our sin. You know, the moral issue involved here uh, is quite legion that we can extray as we discuss uh, subaltern stud studies. And then the cognitive dimension, who controls the power to produce knowledge, regulate it, and disseminate it, okay? Thought informs action, as Grumer was saying, is conscientism. But what informs thought? Ideologies are one of those things that inform thought and influence the perception of reality. And in turn, are thinking about the world. Ideologies, which are a collection, of course, ideas that promote certain desirable ideals for positive ones and undesirable beliefs for positive, for negative ideologies. They have immense power about the mind. Unlike Freta, who theorizes that observation of difference influences the mind of the superman, I theorize that the ideology of reverse community is what does that. Now, to understand the mind of the superaltern, I give you three components of reverse coloniality. One is fear, fear of being seen as the last born of civilization. Okay? Remember, before the Greek civilization, regarded as the boyhood of European civilization, emerged, there were the Chinese civilization dating over 5,000 years BCE, the Egyptian civilization, the Mesopotamian civilization dating over 3,500 years BCE before the Greek civilization. And of course, the ancient model of history informs us that the, uh, uh, the Egyptians and the Phoenicians, the Semites, colonized the people of the Aegeans and the mixture of this thing created eventually the Greek civilization. Now that, 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 that's all this history shows that the Euro-Western uh, uh, bloc came late to the match of civilization. So the fear of being seen as the last born of civilization was haunting the mind of the super -altern. Look at his manifestation in history. Alexander the Great wanted to conquer the then known world. He, of course, was suited by Aristotle and got to know how the Greeks right last. He wanted, how do you write the rewrite history? to make sure that you are somewhere on top of it, if not to defeat those who were there before you. He failed. Look at Caesar, the Romans, the British, trying to colonialism, conquer the world. It's not about looking for resources. It's about trying to, if we came last to civilization, let us act, at least do something that will peg us up there. The Spanish, Portuguese, Germans, their colonial missions, slaughtering people, wiping out the Indians and all that. It is an attempt to show that even if we came last to civilization, we could do something larger than ourselves that puts us on top of it somehow. The second comp comp component of the reverse coloniality that is in the functionality of the mind of the superaltern is obsession. The superaltern is obsessed with proving a moot point. All right? And because of that obsession, the Gottingen School of History, for example, uh, um, made an attempt to distort history, okay, and 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 and, and uh, uh, wrote away the ancient model of history that shows that Africans colonized the Greeks, okay. That would not be acceptable. So they invented a new story of a certain invasion from the north of Europe that was not recorded in history, okay. Uh, it was from there that the mixture of the, the Europeans from the north and the west created the Greek civilization, all right? The obsession also drove the super -altern to create scientific criticism, to generate scientific data to show that it is superior and the idea of Arianism. Colonialism was now an extension of that. Let's go to different places in the world and keep everybody down. The obsession and then the trauma 
It's another major item in the mind of the superintendent. Okay, as I be to summarize this as fast as possible. All right, the trauma from historical moments deemed unfortunate. The Egyptian and the Phoenician colonized Greece, Greece, the boyhood of European civilization. That's traumatic. All right, for a people who wish to be on top of that. All right, now the collapse of the Greek Empire eventually, the civilization, the, the collapse of the Roman Empire, the loss of Jerus Jerusalem, and the crushing defeat of the Arabs, the Jerusalem. These are moments in history that we are deemed unfortunate. <clears throat> and psychologists tell us that trauma, as well as obsession and fear, uh, influence the way human beings behave and act. And, 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 and you could see all that in the violence of colonialism and coloniality. And then the fourth component of reverse coloniality that affects the functioning of the superotan, the mind of the superotan, is delusion. Okay? The delusion to perfect cherished ideas. The idea that we, I am superior. The idea that we rule the world. The idea that history begins with us and all that. And it continues everywhere. You can see people trying to write the history of different people in Africa, even history of African philosophy. And some European colleagues are writing sort of distortions and saying there's history, placing Europeans on the beginning of such histories. Now, we are talking about the mental construction of the super -autan. And there are two theories, beyond Freitas, cyclic mentality theory and my linear mentality theory. This is the diagram of Freitas cyclic mentality theory, okay? The, the, all these problems we have in our world begins with this super -autan who observes difference in the world. And that difference gives it normative interpretation, produces the superior one and the inferior other. Goes because he's entitled, he feels entitled to dominate the inferior order. And then it, it does everything that will uh, sustain and reinforce the, the his superiority and inferiority of the other one. Well, this is not my thinking of it. I think the mind of the super -autan is linear, all right? It, of being seen as the last born of civilization. That triggers obsession to prove a moot, moot point. And the trauma you know, that comes with that to ensure that uh, what they have accomplished is sustained and the delusion that yes, the goal that it is superior remains there. Now, what is needed actually is to restructure the way the mind of the super functions through noetic property take, the re-education of the mind, through conceptual critique, as we frame our concepts, uh, the, uh, as I conclude, this is the last page, the European uh, racists who framed scientific racism created color categorizations and they used white symbolizing purity, excellence to symbolize the European stock and use other degenerate colors with all kinds of terrible symbolizations like black to symbolize the African. So the moment you use that color categorization to identify human beings, you accept the symbolizations of these colors. And we are uncritically doing that today. In the mid 20th century in the United States of America, during the human, uh, civil rights movement, uh, uh, Stokely Carmichael and the rest of them could, could not do anything. They knew they couldn't do anything. This, this society is segregated. All right, so what did they do? They decided to valorize the color black. Color black in Spanish means nigger. Nigger in English is black. And today we know that nigger is an offensive word, but why must we continue to call people black? It means the same thing. It symbolizes diabolism, evil, monstrosity, backwardness, darkness, and what have you. Why do we continue to call people white? There is nobody whose skin color is white or brown or red or black in this world. Human beings should be identified, preferably from their geography, European, African, Asian, it's, it's better than color. So conceptual critique enjoys us to be con conscientized in the formulation of our concepts. And fictionalization is a subject of another talk elsewhere. 
Thank you very much uh, for listening to me and uh, thank you, over to you, Philip. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, now I think uh, we are a little bit over time, but I think let's let's uh, cater for about 10 minutes of questions. So um, I think we can take them one by one. If somebody uh, if somebody wants to ask a question, please raise your hand. Okay, please. Um, Ipa Ipa Deola, please. Your question. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the brilliant presentation. Yes, this is a very important topic. It is actually topical. And for someone, especially who has left Africa and traveled perhaps to Europe, every day you confront this in practical terms. And every day you, you, you're forced to think about this. For somebody in Africa, maybe the person is. But my question is, um, Prof, uh, considering the fact that even today, with all this in place, people still struggle to make it to Europe on that very Apologies, we are not hearing anything. Um, yeah, network problem, I guess. Maybe we should go to someone else when um, her network okay. is back, then we'll give her another okay. chance. Can you hear me now? Oh, okay, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, okay. Mm. thank you very much. I we don't know where, where you stopped hearing me. But like I was you saying- You said when, when people travel to Europe, that yes, was where to, we stopped to hearing. Europe, yes from Africa to Europe, just because, and recently the way young Africans celebrate when they're able to leave Africa and make it to Europe, even for, for, some, for some who, who got their paper, their documents, who traveled through legal means, and some, they, they just try to make it to Europe by all means, all means conceivable. So mm. when in, the, in light of all these events, all these happenings, and that people in Europe, Europeans get to see or to hear about or to know about, what do we say to this? I, I think maybe what you, I, I, I perfectly agree with you. I, I totally agree with the, with, with the concept of uh, super that the, that it's coming from, from history, from the, from the fact that their ascendants have at one time or the other uh, colonized African uh, countries or societies. But in recent times, is it not that the way African countries have been um, in a way difficult to live, is, is that not contributing to the, to the, to the sense of superiority that um, contemporary Europeans are having, or the kind of the way they, they, they feel and treat Africans, especially on the soil. I wouldn't know whether. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, I. Um, your question is clear. Um, uh, the point is really the moment the agenda of super alternism. Uh, succeeded, the rest, you know, became a um, uh, question of chain reaction. All right. Um, coloniality created subalternism, subalternism, inferior mentality, by imputing it, by um, uh, imposing it on the mind of those who were formerly colonized through crew culture that they are inferior, their cultures are inferior, everything about them, you're uncivilized, you're barbaric. If you want to be civilized, you've got to abandon everything about you and then begin to try to become a European. You recall the French policy during, in West Africa, French policy of assimilation 
all right, trying to strip Africans of the Africanness and whitewash them uh, in French European garb. It does not work. The concept that uh, Tempels used to describe the devolu, the, the concept of deraciness, according to Colin King, and, um, and all that. So, yes, the subaltern. The formerly colonized people are victims of super, super alternism. They are victims. That's all right. And, and if you look at the four components in the mind of the super alternative, fear, obsession, trauma, and delusion, all right, all geared towards sustaining, sustaining um, uh, the goal of uh, super alternism and sub -alternism. So it's difficult for these Africans to have a breath of fresh air. Do you ever wonder, in brief, why governments in Africa are performing so poorly? The intellectual subordination and sub subjugation is rift, is real, all right? And, 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 and this accounts for why the subaltern continues to behave like the subaltern. And insofar as that is working, the super alternative continues to bask in the delusion of his superiority and continues to put things in place that will continue to sustain such order. If things were the way they should be, if there was internal confidence, uh, if the sense of self of the subaltern is as it should be, then the subaltern would not be subaltern. The subaltern will realize that it is a human being capable of designing his destiny and future. I would do that and there would not be anyone struggling to go to anywhere because you can do whatever you think for yourself in your home. But when you've been emasculated to the point that you don't even know that you've got the capacity and when uh, and, the, and how to put things in order to enable you do those things, and then your story continues to be as it is, all right? And the story of the super -otan continues to be as it is, but both the super -otan and the super -otan, they are all fictions, ontological fictions. They are not real. And I will discuss the subjects of their creation in another talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so the next question uh, is Ari Baya. Um, please. All right. Thank you very much, Prof, um, for your talk. I have just two brief questions. Uh, the first question is, um, you talked about noetic propodeutic um, education of the mind. What what does that look like um, in terms of what you're trying to do? And then my second question is, is uh, there are now there's a new phenomena um, called well not really new but a phenomena called virtue signaling. Um, and so it seems to me that. Um, the super altered mind sometimes can be subdued in such a way that it it, it requires of itself to sh make a show of um, complementarity, right? Without actually expressing those that complementarity in actual and very real time. So it's just a show uh, of complementarity. So within that kind of with that kind of mindset, do you think it's a sub sub altered mindset or a super altered mindset? Where that is when when the 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 oppressor, whether it's uh, in terms of race, gender, or whatever, uh, tries to make a, a show of uh, solidarity without actually being uh, um, showing that solidarity in concrete terms, if you must put it like that. So is that a subaltern mindset or a, or a superaltern mindset? A troubled mind is anxious, and an anxious mind is confused, it's a confused mind. Um, uh, but because there is no inherent internal confidence in the posturing that is being adopted, there is no such internal confidence. All right? Um, when the superaltern purportedly makes such a gesture, it is not. It is not that they mean it. It is not that the super term, you know, means it. And you have to be very careful here in my definition. When I talk about super term and talk about super term, find these people. It does not mean that 
uh, everyone in that geography called subaltern is actually a subaltern. No, it does not mean that everyone in the geography where I delineate for superalterns is actually a superaltern. No. Okay, there are people who are in the formerly colonized area that are not subalterns. They're not subalterns because they're not victims of inferior mentality. There are people in the uh, geography of the former colonialists that are not superalterns because they are not victims of superior mentality. All right? Uh -huh. So, but the victims of superior mentality, those are troubled people, troubled souls without self confidence, you know, inflated sense of the self that are vacuous, empty, and simply not correct. And it, it drives their actions, okay? And because of the internal contradictions that characterize their mindsets, it's not altogether uh, unthinkable to see a super -altern behave in a way that is not expected of a super -altern. all right? Like uh, these gestures or not, whether the, whether the super -altern means it or not, it is because of internal contradiction uh, that the fictional, the, the fictional personality of the superaltern engenders that this predisposes the superaltern to such contradictory actions. All right. Uh, when a superaltern acts that way, it doesn't mean that it's no longer a superaltern overnight. No. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have two more questions, and I think we're going to need to finish after that. Uh, Diana Abassi, please. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank the lecturer for a very lucid presentation. Um, I have a, just one concern, because earlier on in the day, I listened to a, a, a podcast by uh, Freta concerning the superiorism and uh, Superhaltonism. Now, the, uh, the main issue is that the lecturer is saying that um, coloniality or colonialism contributed principally to to the development of the subaltern mentality. Uh, super, yes, mentality. Now, my question is: Didn't we have this uh, subaltern and superaltern mentality in the pre-colonial Africa? Uh, because uh, looking at it from the psychological angle, the development of me uh, mentality by individuals, there are various factors that contributed to or that, con that contribute to development of personal personality. And I think one of them uh, is just uh, in for, uh, the, for the colonized people, just one of them is colonialism, and that is not all of it. So I, I think we cannot blame everything on that, on, uh, on colonialism. There should be other factors. For example, imagination of the African, for example, imagining that this grass is greener on the other side, uh, has contributed to this uh, mentality of subalternism. So how does the uh, lecturer, how will he respond to that, the fact, of course, that they were subaltern before the, colo the Europeans colonized, for example, Africa? Thank you. <laughs> Um, I thank you very much, um, uh, um It's important for us to uh, understand the psychology of the super autumn that I try to extract. Uh, yes, coloniality, not colonialism. I say coloniality created okay. subalternism. Okay. And reverse coloniality created superalternism. Both of them are mutations of colonialism. All right? Mutated at the intellectual level. Now, um, uh, you said that there no superaltern mentality, subaltern mentality in Africa before colonialism and all that. You have to understand the uh, the four, the four psychological influences at the core of superaltern mind, fear, and I trace the origin of that fear to history. All right, fear of being seen as the last born of civilization. 
um, obsession in order not to, in order to rewrite that history, the superotan became so obsessed that he could do literally anything. And you could see the, in the Gottingen School of History at the University of Gottingen in the uh, 18th century, you see a man known as Karl Alt Müller uh, masterminded the toppling of the ancient model of history. That, according to Martin Bernal himself, has no internal problems whatsoever. And, uh, and replaced it with an Aryan model that is now, that from then onwards was being taught in schools in Europe. And then if you were an African, you came to Europe to study in this 19th or 20th century, that was what you were taught. And you took it home. People went to different places with colonialism, missionaries. They were teaching this, but it was history doctored in the 18th century. And I gave you a presentation by, uh, I, I discussed the presentation by Tidman, who compared data generated from this, from studying the minds and the brains and skulls of different races of the world. And the most showed that those who studied this thing left the data, what the data revealed and published something else just to support scientific racism, all right? Now, these are the things that makes a superotan. A superotan is not just someone who is driven by interest, okay, to do the other person, no. Of course, there is a reason that you a superotan is not someone who is just lying there and willing to do anything for himself and achieve some. No, of course, there are lazy people everywhere in the world. Okay, a subaltern is one whose station, whose mental construction was influenced by the ideology of colonialism, perpetrated by the superaltern. That is my definition of the subaltern and the subaltern. So um, when you go and you see people, poor people around, it doesn't mean that they are subalterns. It is the construction of a somebody's mind that will show us whether that person is a subaltern or a superaltern. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, just uh, uh, digest. Um, I'm Go going on. from a sociopolitical background. I'm coming from a sociopolitical background. Um, in a sociopolitical philosophy in Africa, we are trying to look at this issue of blaming the Europeans for some of the ills that we find in Africa. Uh, like uh, uh, the idea of trying to pin the African problem on colonialism by the Europeans seems to Europeanize African problem. And it seems to alienate the African from their problem and the, uh, uh, on the, uh, incapacitate the African to really solve his problem. Because if I accuse the African of, or the uh, European of causing my problem, I will not look at this, some of the hills caused by me. I'll be looking at the European. So that's the angle I'm coming from, that this super holotonism that we are talking about, we should uh, de-Europeanize it. And uh, then factor that Africans themselves contributed to the development of this mentality, the development of this personality. That is the angle I, I'm coming from. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, some people will say that you are correct. Of course, um, Freta has given us the brilliant concept of art segregation aware of going backwards. If you are in a problem, you know you are in trouble. You know, Africans know that they are in trouble. And there's something they can do to extricate themselves from that trouble. But you have to ask yourself, uh, if you do not know the extent of damage, the magnitude of the problem you have, how, would you even, how, how, how possible is it that you could even solve it? And we're not talking about individual problems here. We're talking of something that is at the level of the collective. So, assuming you, uh, as, as, or I as an individual, by some luck, you know, we're able to shake off a uh, subaltern mentality. How can I, as an alone individual, uh, save Africa? Okay, there are many people involved. It's a, it's a collective level, it's a collective mental damage that we are talking about here. But make no mistake, the super autonomy is also a victim uh, of, 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 of his weapon, okay? And, and it's a victim that has created new victims, a collective victim 
uh, from history that was hunting the super rotan, the so society, the super rotan society from the beginning, from the beginning of their history. Okay, so otherwise, how can somebody, how can somebody say that he wants to bring civilization to a people and ends up killing half of the population? Does that make sense? Is that something that a mentally healthy person should do, could do? We have to understand that a super, super altern is a troubled mind. And I have analyzed the mind of the super altern to tell you three basic components, terrible things going on that uh, inform the construction of the mind of the super altern. If super altern needs help as much as the super altern, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's another question which popped up. I propose that we take both questions and then, uh, Jonathan, you can reply and then we can finish. Okay, okay. that's what I got. Okay. Uh, please, uh, Maduka and Yamba. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I also want to thank the presenter for the insightful presentation. I have just one question. And this question is based on two major submissions that you made while presenting. Number one, in, distinguish, in distinguishing your uh, ideas from that of Fred, uh, you stated that both the sub super -ordan and sub -ordan are victims of extreme ideologies. The super Ordan is a, is a victim of extreme, I mean, a victim of uh, reverse coloniality, and sub a victim of coloniality. These are extreme ideologies, as you rightly stated. And if that is the case, extremes, extremes are not supposed to be something that is comfortable, something that is positive, extremes. And if that is taken, then the next submission which uh, I put together, then I pose my question, is your definition of reverse coloniality. You define reverse coloniality as a positive ideology that deludes the mind and drives its victims to irrational pursuit. And this in itself is, is, is a negative nature. It's, it's by the definition and by the nature of reverse coloniality, it is negative. Now, my question is, why do you prefer to conceive reverse coloniality as a positive ideology, given the affirmation submissions you made? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. And the second question. Uh, Francis, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Professor Jonathan, thank you for your presentation. My own is just a reaction thank you. on the, the person that talked about before Dr. Madoka's uh, question that was talking about uh, why are most Africans because of this issue of uh, subalternism and uh, superalternism keep on blaming their woes upon the Europeans. My brothers, it's a very serious issue. Let me make an analogy. Assuming a child is growing up, maybe a lady, a girl, a young girl is growing up, and it is virgin that lady. You know, <laughs> it's a lot, it causes a lot of trauma to the person. Even until she, until she, she becomes an adult or even uh, an elderly person, it continues to haunt the person, it continues to uh, uh, be a, a serious issue to the person. You know? That's why people also continue to blame the woes of uh, Africans on the uh, the colonial masters. They rip them a lot of a lot a lot of things. We were raped, and it's still haunting us. Then, as much as we make effort to find solution to our problems, it still haunts us. We pray that we get over it. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Francis, for that um, clarity you offered. There, I agree with you. I do not agree that we should pray about it. So I believe we should work out our own faith, all right? And um, determine the direction of our destiny. Uh, that is the way I believe we can wriggle out of the problem. 
Now to the first question that Madoka asked that why I, despite presenting reverse coloniality as something negative, uh, goes ahead to describe this as a positive ideology. I think I explained this because of my, my talk. It is because it is an ideology that produce, promises something at the end. It gives hope, okay? Even though that hope is an illusion, he hope that you could become superior, say superhuman. He hope that you could become the uh, pure race, identified as a pure race. He hope that you could distort all history so that and rewrite them and make it look at all history begins with you. We hope that um, you could lord it over different peoples of the world. That, that looks positive to the victim. So that idea of positivity that I used to describe it is more of a, a something that points to uh, the illusion that it creates for the victim. Uh, and, and, and that is the point that uh, needs to be emphasized and cannot be overemphasized that the superaltern is as much a victim as the subaltern. And the moment we realize that and begin to pay attention to the study of the mind of the superaltern, we'll be able to understand why the superaltern has done what it has done in history and why he's doing what it is doing uh, still we'll be able to understand why the subaltern is struggling to come out of that heavy weight, to come out of where it is buried, why it is struggling everywhere. What is happening in South Africa? Uh, what is happening to uh, native South Africans? is not different from what is happening to Africans in America. What is happening in Uganda is not different from what is happening in the Congo. What is happening politically in Nigeria is not different from what is happening in the Gambia. It's the same thing everywhere. The spear of superalternism is spinning the subaltern down. And it is difficult, ever more so, for the subaltern to shake it off and uh, plot uh, a new trajectory for its destiny. Uh, but in understanding the psychology, the philosophical psychology behind it all, we might be able to contrive you know, and work out uh, strategies for resolution. And Dion Freta has given us quite a host of wonderful concepts. I am uh, bringing some new and engaging with him uh, in order that we can drive forward the area of study known as super altern studies. Let us also study the mind of the super altern. Thank you for your questions and for all of you who have um, joined us today. Let us contribute. Thank you. Over to you, Philip. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thanks, um, Jonathan, uh, for your talk, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, it's been a good discussion. Um, um, so um, I hope to see you all uh, at our next colloquium. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.